Perfect. Um, it should be working now. Um, you are welcome to use the chat box uh, for, for questions, uh, reflections uh, during the talk or raise your hand uh, should you wish to speak publicly uh, during the Q&A uh, session and we will call um, on you. If you would like to address your question uh, or questions uh, privately, please do direct them uh, to me um, and or Asha. Um, the third principle, um, you may keep um, your cameras on, but please keep your mics on mute uh, when not speaking to avoid uh, background noise. Um, the next one, and it is very important uh, to remember that this event is a space for dialogue. Uh, so respect, empathy, care, listening, and love are key to holding a constructive uh, conversation. Um, use the following event hashtag uh, if you would like, uh, EDNRRMUNA21 on social media, if you would like to tweet. Uh, EDN stands for Exeter Decolonizing Network, RR Roots Resistance, and you know MUNA21. Um, um, and the last one, if after the event you have felt that you are having an emotional reaction, uh, please do not hesitate um, to contact us. Uh, we are here to listen and uh, to support each other. So this is it for me and Asha, my colleague, is going to introduce our guest speaker. It's a great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Mona Abdi, whose work has had great impact on my thinking and practice. And I'm beyond ecstatic to be here today to listen and to learn. Dr. Mona Abdi is a leading education uh, consultant and independent researcher with over 10 years experience in education, research and community engagement. She has previously worked as a youth worker and university lecturer and is currently the director of MA Education Consultancy. Mona's research and practice is grounded on the principle of decolonial and anti-racist thought. Mona engages with method methodological and ethical dilemma in research, dilemmas in research and is, and is interested in research that is done with and not on the communities. A trailblazer in community engaged research and pedagogy, Dr. Mona develops and delivers innovative and culturally appropriate training throughout the country. Mona sits on number Muna sits on a number of local and national boards and is also a public speaker, appearing, on, appearing as a keynote speaker for academic, corporate and charity function. Um, Dr. Muna Abdi, thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Aisha and Riyad. First of all, thank you for the invitation um, to be here. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you all. The topic that we're gonna be discussing over the next half an hour during the presentation for those of you that are able to make the workshop um, in much more detail in, in the workshop is a topic that is very close to my heart and is very close to my practice. Just to give you a little bit of a context into um, the work that I do, I started off doing this work with young people. So I was a youth worker, um, primarily working with young people who were experiencing exclusion within schools, whether that is formal exclusion or the experience of exclusion within the school space. I then went on to work with parents as an advocate for school, the parents whose children were excluded in a number of different ways within the school context. And gradually through my process within academia, I ended up working with educators, realizing that in order for change to happen around these classroom dynamics, it is important that we work with those that are the facilitators in those spaces and that are leading the spaces that we are hoping to, to change. And so I've always revisited this topic from a number of different perspectives, and I'll be bringing some of those into the presentation that I share with you today. It's really important before I go into the content of the, the presentation that we're clear on the language that is going to be used. And we always start off any presentation that we do in anti-racism work with ensuring that there is that shared language and there is that shared literacy. And there are two concepts I'm going to be exploring in the presentation today, and those are the concepts of racism and the concepts of whiteness and, and white supremacy. And it's important to understand what those two terms mean. When I'm referring to racism, what I'm referring to is an ideology. It's an ideology that gives expressions to myths about racialized groups 
and devalues and renders inferior those groups based on these constructions. It's reflected and it's perpetuated and it's deeply rooted in our historical, social, cultural and power inequalities within society. I'd like us to shift from a general understanding of racism that we would see in the sort of mainstream discourse that would frame racism as being um, discriminatory behavior that is perpetuated by individuals to seeing it as being far more complex and to be a complex interplay of dynamics that are both structural, systemic and interpersonal. I also want us to be clear on what we mean when we talk about white supremacy, which is a term that we will be referring to. White supremacy is a political, economic and cultural system in which those who are racialized as white within this broader system of racism are able to control power and material resources. It's about the conscious and the unconscious ideas of white supremacy and entitlement that are widespread and embedded into our everyday dimensions and our, and our everyday practices. White supremacy isn't just men that are in um, KKK suits or white supremacists, it's in those everyday interactions and those everyday practices that we see that uphold white dominance in the spaces that we're in. And racism as a structure is the totality of those social relations and practices that reinforce those power dynamics and reinforce the privilege that is allocated to some and not allocated to others. And so as I go into the, the presentation now, I really just want us to share this space with one another and consider some of the pedagogical encounters I'm gonna share with you all, some of the theoretical contributions and also and to consider the classroom as a site of ongoing tension. Nothing that I'm sharing with you today is um, fixed in any particular way. It's constantly being shaped through our conversations and through our changing perspective. And so I want these to be provocations that lead on to further conversations for us to have. And so I start off by thinking about the classroom as an invisible frame. And we talk about the classroom as being a site in which lots of different interactions and dynamics take place. And what I want to argue for the purpose of the presentation today is that the interactions that take place within that classroom are shaped around whiteness. And when we talk about whiteness, what I'm referring to is a specific dimension of racism that serves to elevate those who are racialized as white. Again, reminding ourselves that this is a definition that goes beyond the dominant representation of racism as being isolated discriminatory behaviors that individuals may demonstrate. When I'm referring to whiteness, I'm referring to a more nuanced understanding of that goes beyond simply naming the advantages or privileges that are afforded to particular groups of people and the disadvantages that are experienced by others. Whiteness is intricate. It refers to the way in which white people are actively shaped, affected, defined and elevated through their racialization. It becomes embedded in the individual and collective consciousness and shapes them in their racialized identity as white in the space. Whiteness is a constellation of processes and practices. It's not simply skin color, it's dynamic and it operates at all times on a myriad of levels. And so when we think about the classroom as a white space, we're not talking about the physical representation in that classroom. We're talking about all of the ways in which whiteness is functioning at every level within that space. Whiteness is always present. It's always asserting values, perspectives, practices and experiences that it purports to be shared by all but are only consistently afforded to those racialized as white. So when we think of something as being the social norm in a space, there is the assumption that if it's a social norm, it is shared by all, that it is a, a, a norm that is only affords, only affords benefits to the few. And when we talk about whiteness, that is creating a norm that affords benefits to those racialized as white in that space. And so whiteness becomes the normative of the space, the standard by which other practices, knowledges and behaviours are judged. Whiteness isn't named in the space that it's in, nor is it marked. It is invisible. 
And so when we talk about the classroom as holding an invisible frame of whiteness, it's really important for us to acknowledge that all, the, all of the things that we are naming are making things that are invisible, visible to us. It's really important to understand as well that whiteness strives for permanence. It is a process that is actively striving to embed a power dynamic and sustain that power dynamic. And so it frames the space to determine who is within that space and who is without. And so we can use the analogy or the, the metaphor of a frame to um, articulate the way in which whiteness strives to hold individuals within that frame, meaning within the understanding of whiteness or outside without. And we'll talk about the impact of being without that frame as well. In defining itself as the norm, it defines the other. Professor Anne Phoenix, who coined the concept of the normalized absence and pathologized presence, beautifully explains the way that socially, particular groups of um, people are socially excluded through the marking and unmarking of their bodies and practices and behaviors in spaces. The invisibility or the normalized absence of blackness in the classroom is marked in our practices, in our curriculums, in our policies, in the ways that we make sense of and understand the everyday dimensions of relationality within that space. And the visibility of blackness becomes apparent in the space when its presence is problematized as a hindrance or as an exception to the norm. And so we've constructed whiteness as being the norm. And the only time that blackness is um, seen as a pathologized presence in that space is when it is a hindrance to that norm, meaning if there is a resistance to that norm and when it's an exception to the norm, when it's going against the rules that have been set for that space. Blackness is thus marked and seen to exist only in the crossing of boundaries. Only when it crosses the boundary of how it is perceived by whiteness is it seen as a pathologized blackness in the space. Those racialized as black enter into a space that is, that, that is framed to mark them as without or to shape them as within. Mm. And so it's really important for us to consider what we are walking into these spaces with. W.E.B. Dubois referred to a term that, that is known as double consciousness to help us make sense of this experience. When you are somebody that is racialized as black and you are walking into a space that is marking you in a particular way, the process by which we make sense of that space can sometimes be referred to as double consciousness. And W. E. V. Dubois referred to double consciousness as a way of making sense of the two-ness experienced by individuals who are both the subject and the object of a problem in a space. Dubois was interested in the ways in which individuals navigate their way through the world where blackness is constructed as a problem, while simultaneously acknowledging, while simultaneously not acknowledging or explicitly addressing blackness as being the problem. So it's walking into a space and seeing yourself as being marked in a particular way, but not being able to articulate what that marking is and make sense of it as being marked as a problem. And Fanon, builds on this discussion and argues that when a black subject enters the constructed world of whiteness, it is an effort to diminish his self-esteem and an effort to diminish his confidence. Every aspect of your identity that is constructed or marked as the other in a space is a power dynamic, a dynamic that is constantly reminding you of the ways in which you are far away from what is perceived to be the norm or the standard in that space. This often results in the altering of behavior to emulate whiteness within that space. Dubois uses the metaphor of the veil to explain the state of double consciousness, so whereby one becomes aware of or discovers their racialized presence in a space and begins to see himself as the other. The veil is both internal and external, according to Dubois. And so it refers to both the behavior and the psyche. 
He argues that it's possible to live beneath and above the veil, but it's impossible for one to get rid of the veil entirely. And so this experience of othering, this experience of seeing yourself through the eyes of others is taken in through your psyche and is manifested through your behavior. This is why both Dubois and Fanon refer to blackness as being problematic, particularly because of the ways in which it's built around white subjectivity. The frame of whiteness is how we make sense of blackness in a space. Because whiteness relies on the construction of other in order for white normativity to remain intact, those who are racialized in white spaces are not permitted to exist as objects within that space, but as, as subjects within that space, but as objects to be seen and to be shaped only by whiteness. For blackness to exist outside of the framing of whiteness is an impossibility in a space that is designed to hold whiteness in place. And so it's important for us to think about what that means for the interactions that we engage with in the space that we enter into. That framing of whiteness in the space creates what we refer to as social norms, social practices within our classroom. And those social norms in the classroom are often the unmarked assemblages of whiteness. They are the teacher's understandings of particular types of behavior students' interactions with one another, the curriculum that we see, the assessments that students are asked to engage with, the classroom space and how it is shaped, the way in which practices and activities are modeled in the classroom. All of those dynamics, all of those dimensions are the intricate assemblages of whiteness in a space. When you are marked as the other in that space, you become acutely aware of what the standard of measure is in all of those different areas. Whether it is named, whether it is acknowledged or not, you are aware of what those measures are. And students of color are often reprimanded for not living up to what these social norms are. And this is really indicative in the, of the way in which structure, structural relationships deem whiteness as being right in a space and anything that is deemed to be outside of that framing as being wrong. We can see this in the statistics around the number of students who have been excluded from spaces, the number of students who are um, sent to isolation units within schools, the way in which students are marked as having persistent disruptive behavior, the way in which students' behaviors are, are used as a way of masking or disguising um, the, 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 the learning needs of those students on a structural level. All of these are examples of the ways in which structure enables whiteness to remain intact and enables those who are marked as other to remain visible as the pathologized other. And even when one strives to assimilate to the frames that have been set for them in order to be unseen, trying to fit into that invisible frame of whiteness in order to become part of that normalized absence in an attempt to escape the pathologized presence. Whiteness has to be performed. And when we talk about this concept of acting white, it is an acknowledgement that there are practices normalized within the space that are understood to belong to some and not belong to others. If you are marked as the other, you can engage with, you can successfully emulate some practices of whiteness, but you can never be white in that space. That is to say, you will never be representative of the constructed norm in that space, nor will you be afforded the benefits of performing whiteness in that space. Whiteness is a position of power that maintains the permanence of, of power within, of dynamics within the space. And that has to exist through the impossibility of blackness. Even in its attempts, whether those are consciously or unconsciously to be unseen, the black body is always seen. Blackness is pathologized, even in its emulation of whiteness. And we see this through the enactments of 
respectability politics and assimilation within the classroom. There is no way to be unseen in a space that constructs you and marks you as the other. And so if it is impossible for those who are racialized as white to engage in activities that make them unseen in a space that marks them as the other, what makes us think as educators, we can unsee those dynamics. And so it's really important to interrogate this notion of color blindness and this notion of deracing the classroom that is pervasive within, our, within the educational discourse at the moment that is really detrimental to us doing work around racial equity moving forward. The power of whiteness is framed in its invisibility. And those who are racialized as white participate knowingly or unknowingly in ways that actively hold those constructs of whiteness in place. That's not to say that not that's not to say that all white people embody whiteness. You can identify as white and not participate in or perpetuate the rules and the norms of whiteness. But it's important to acknowledge that those who are racialized as white are subjects of whiteness because it benefits and privileges them in the space that they are in. And so when our educators, who in the UK mostly are racialized as white, claim to be colorblind or attempt to de-race their classroom space, this not only negates the realities of those who sit outside of the white normative frame, who are marked as the other, and through all of their attempts, whether they attempt to fit into that frame or recognize that they are marked as without in that frame, it negates those experiences within the classroom and it preserves their position of power and privilege within the constructs of whiteness. So when we think about the impossibility of blackness in the space, what we're thinking about in terms of the colorblind discourse is you cannot even acknowledge those dynamics in a space that is deemed to be colorblind because your experience and your reality is negated by those who hold the power and the privileges of whiteness. And Steck describes this really beautifully in stating that de-racing is a work of ignoring the societal structures and institutional practices that sustain our racial hierarchies. It's based on the assumption that one can and should come out of a group-based status and replace it with individual ethos and, and stresses merit and progress towards realizable and concrete goals without acknowledging the, the fact that those goals are defined by whiteness. Those goals are presented as being available to all in order to appeal to a non-racial standpoint. But as we said with whiteness as a frame in the, in the very start of this presentation, those goals are only afforded to those who are racialized as white. And so we talk about the notion of moving goalposts, taking a colorblind approach, but there being moving goalposts where those who are racialized as black are never quite good enough in the spaces that they're in. Such a non-racial standpoint is important for groups that hold power because it ensures that they are not viewed as groups while still enabling the structures and practices that maintain group-based powers to remain in place. Taking a colorblind approach benefits those who are racialized as white because it means they do not have to be defined as a group and therefore can work on individual um, responsibilities. And that negates the, 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 the structural and the systemic nature of racism that we are all interwoven in. Whiteness should not be looked at um, as simply a category of identity, but as a position of power that is formed and protected through colonialism, slavery, segregation, and oppression. Those who are racialized as white therefore have the choice to participate in the social construction of whiteness. We said earlier on that whiteness isn't a racial marker. It's a number of processes and practices that form an assemblage, but it benefits those who are racialized as white. And therefore for those who are racialized as white, dismantling the constructs of whiteness is a choice. And it's a choice that comes with loss, and it's a choice that comes with sacrifice. <laughs>
And so what does this mean for us as educators in thinking about and rethinking about the classrooms that we work within? How do we move forward from this pedagogical discomfort? There are a number of things that we can do. First and foremost, it's about acknowledging what we mean by whiteness and how it functions in the spaces that we work within. Critical whiteness studies put, puts forth the argument that to promote anti-racist action and to advocate for marginalized students, educators who are racialized as white must first understand what whiteness is, its socio-historical construction and their own identities in relation to whiteness, because that ultimately dominates the classroom. It dominates the classroom dynamics, it dominates the classroom interactions, and it dominates the educator's judgment on what is and is not permissible within that space. It is a responsibility of white educators to recognize the role of whiteness in the classroom and the impact it has on the students of color they teach. One of the fundamental ways in which we can start to think about this on a, in, on a structural level is to think about how we embed this learning in our teacher education programs and to ensure that it remains as part of all educators' continued professional development. This is a responsibility of both those that run teacher education programs and those that lead the schools where our children are being educated. It also requires us to embed that structural change. It requires commitment from leaders to ensure that this work is resourced, that this work is supported and that this work is sustained. As Powell points out, a structural perspective looks not only at individuals or even institutional practices in isolation, but how those practices are influenced by and contribute to histories of racial discrimination. What takes place in the classroom doesn't just take place in the classroom. The classroom is a microcosm of what we see in society. And classrooms are relational spaces. Those that are racialized as white and those who are racialized as black experience the space in ways that are shaped and tied to histories. Students who are racialized as black continue to live out these histories in their daily lives and are thus subject to ongoing harm and ongoing trauma in these classrooms. In the simplest term, when we are referring to trauma, we're referring to the impact on a psychological level, on a physiological level of violence. And that violence is um, both systemic, it's structural and it's interpersonal. Trauma-informed practice is a really helpful approach for engaging with some of this trauma in the classroom spaces that we work within. It asks professionals to pause and consider the, ro the role of trauma as lingering traumatic stress and the impact that it plays and in how people interact and engage with the spaces that they're in. It asks us to ask questions about the steps that we take to avoid or at least minimize the additional stresses that, that may um, accumulate in the spaces that we are in. And to ensure that we are not inadvertently reminding young people of their traumas. It asks us to think about how we can be better help to young people that experience trauma and how we can support their healing. And in effect, by looking at how the entire system is organized and how services are de delivered, it allows us to ask the question of what can and should be done differently. If the, the invisible frame that shapes the classrooms that we work within is built around this construction of whiteness, the most essential question that we can ask in it and unmarking some of these spaces and undoing some of these spaces is to ask the question of what should be done differently. And trauma-informed practice is strengths-based. It is about reframing complex behavior, looking at, presenting, thinking about the phenomena in a new and different way and replacing the traditional individual approaches that we take to what would be more social perspectives, focusing specifically on equity and justice. The closest that we can see in resemblance to this within trauma-informed practice would be looking at the social model of disability as opposed to the medical model of disability. Ultimately, it's about reframing our behaviors 
uh, and thinking about behavior as meaningful in order to allow educators to address the underlying issues and utilize less intrusive and punitive strategies. The only way you can make change in a classroom as an educator is to do the work of unlearning how you make sense of that space. When you unlearn how you make sense of that space, you begin to come into the space and think about it differently. But it ultimately starts with you. And it's about framing the classroom, not as a space of, of whiteness, but changing that to a space of social justice. And social justice in education, first and foremost, takes a moral position. It critiques society as being unjust and identifies structures and practices throughout um, social life as being inherently biased. When we take an anti-racist approach to the work that we do within the systems and structures we work within, we focus on two things. The need to highlight the moral imperative that racism is wrong and that there needs to be a commitment to anti-racist education. And secondly, to work to empower those within those spaces to raise their voice against the oppressions that they are experiencing. When we are working within the classroom and when we are educators who are seeking to empower students to raise their voice, it's important for us to remember how dangerous it can be for some students to be seen in classrooms when they are marked as without the frame of that classroom. So this work has to be done with care. Education for social justice takes an approach to learning and teaching that is based essentially on human rights and humanizing rights. Active participation, the evaluation of change and the empowerment of people to become actively involved in their own construction of self and their own construction of sense-making. This is about reflective practice. It's about delving deeply and thinking critically about how we have been constructed in the spaces that we are in, how we experience those spaces and how those around us experience those spaces too. And as McKinney 2005 beautifully states, our task in the classroom is not to be merely instructive as educators, but to think of ourselves as co-creators. We are shifting perspective. And when we make the choice to shift the perspective towards particular values, I invite you to think about shifting those values to anti-racism and to see the value in constructing and co-creating the classroom space as a space that is anti-racist. And to conclude, I just wanna share with you some narratives of parents, young people and educators who shared with me their experiences of the impossibility of blackness in, in school spaces and within classrooms. And as we look through some of these examples, I just want you to explore, explore it within the context of the framing that we've had a look at through this presentation and to ask yourself the question of, what does this tell us about the structure of our education system? What does this tell us about the power of whiteness? And what does this tell us about the trauma of whiteness in the classroom and the impossibility of blackness. And so just to go through some of these examples with you. The first is an example by Musa. He was a 14 year old boy who was talking about the way in which he was being challenged in the school space to constantly behave in a particular way. And in the conversation that we had, he, he articulated really well the way in which he was being surveillance. His body was being surveillance, his behavior was being surveillance, and he was always being marked in a particular way based on how he was behaving according to the way in which his teachers perceived him. And he said, when you come to school, you're expected to walk a certain way, talk a certain way. If you talk outside of that, most of the teachers um, kind of look at you and they want to correct you or say that's not right. I want you to just think about that within the context of what we were discussing around the framing of whiteness, that frame of sitting people within and shaping them within or seeing them as the pathologized one and other when they sit without that frame. I then share with you a narrative from a parent, Melanie, who talked about the experiences of both of her children 
within the school space. And Melanie states, we are a dual heritage family and my sons are now wonderful young men. For us, the issue we have experienced, the issues we've experienced have been exasperated because one of our sons is white passing and the other and, and the other not, and that has shaped their experiences in school and the wider community. I've heard the same teachers describe the same behaviours negatively and positively, depending on which child they are describing. Once passion is perceived as challenging behaviour in the other, a sense of justice for one is a strong sense of injustice. My son, who is labelled socially as black, had lower academic expectations placed on him. They both experience undermining and damaging comments about their relationship to one another and to each parent. For example, after I collected one of my sons from nursery, he was asked the next day if I was his new nanny. Even now, the question of whether I am his mom or his stepmom is frequently asked. In senior school, his heritage was constantly questioned. The complexities of racism are compounded in households like ours where society treats some members of our family more favorably than others, just on account of the perception associated with levels of melanin in our skin. I want you to think about this within the context of what we discussed in seeing the interactions that take place within the school space and within the classroom space as not just being situated within those spaces, as seeing the classroom as a microcosm of what we see in society and thinking then about what does this mean for all of those who interact with the school space, not just the students that we have within our classroom and how they are marked within that space, but also what does that mean for those who are their carers, their, their guardians. And then this is by DeMarco, who talked about uh, the family's experiences of having um, a, a number of different neurodivergent individuals and the impact that that had on them receiving support within schools. So DeMarco states, my family is made up of neurodivergent individuals, a collection of ADHD and dyslexia. My younger son was diagnosed first aged 11 because of a gap between his verbal abilities and his ability to express himself on paper and my demands as a teacher parent for him to be assessed because of my concerns for his mental well-being and from being unsupported and the ways in which his behavior as a black boy would be perceived. I was diagnosed at 58 at university and my eldest son at 28. I had questions about my eldest son's reading of the world from preschool, but if he appears white, sounds posh and does well in school, is able to disguise his struggles, so my concerns were always dismissed. Consequently, he has struggled in silence and invisibility. And again, this is an inv invitation to not just think about the structural barriers that are in place, but the way in which these young people have been marked and the, the responsibility that the teacher, the parent has taken in order to push past those systemic and those structural barriers that she's all too aware of because of the histories in that space, the experience of that space. And finally, I share with you an artifact that was shared by one of the young men that I worked with on a project, Ahmed, who talked about how he had to perform different identities within the classroom space. He talked about how there was the assumption from his teachers that he was marked as black and therefore could only perform a black identity and be a part of the pathologized black presence within the classroom space. And he was not permitted to live and perform uh, his identity as a young Muslim man. And he saw those two identities as, as not being able to coexist within the classroom space because his identity as a Muslim in the space was invisible. It was part of the normalized absence and his identity as a young black man was pathologized and it was marked and it was present. And he beautifully articulated his experience by saying, they only see me when I'm someone else. And that disconnect between the way that he's been marked and the way that he um, needs to experience that space and wants to experience that space. So I leave you with these narratives as a point of reflection to think about that and consider that with the provocations that we've shared with you in, in, the, in the presentation today. And for those of you that will be joining us in the workshop, we'll be looking in a lot more detail at some of these examples and others 
in order to just consider what this means for us in, the, in terms of the framing of whiteness within the classroom and what we can do to start to dismantle that. I'll leave it now for any questions that emerge. Thank you, Muna. That was really um, thought provoking. Thanks for interrupting our thinking um, to consider all the points that you've raised in your presentation. And yeah, as Muna said, if you've got any reflection, any question, please uh, do come along. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourselves. Um, either type your question using the chat box or just, um, yeah, as I said, unmute yourself and uh, speak. Thank you so much. Um, I had a reflection. I'm not sure whether it is a question. In my head, it seems like a question, but I'm not sure whether it is. Um, the, 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 invis the, the, the visibility of black blackness in a classroom in terms of school, um, I'm not necessarily sure whether that changes once you leave school, because there is the visibility and invisibility when it comes to black bodies within universities, because I experienced mm -hmm high forms of visibilities, but there are times where it seems like people don't see me, although I'm sitting right next to them. So there are a lot of uh, my classmates who constantly say, to, I've been studying with them for three years. Mm -hmm. Three weeks ago, a um, few of them came up to me and said to me, oh, when are you finishing your PhD? Like, I've been with you in class every day for two years before COVID. How do you not know that I am in the same year as you? And yet they mm. said it as if it was a compliment, but yet for me, it wasn't a compliment because they completely uh, uh, um, uh, uh, made me invisible, yet visible at the same time. So how do we? Yeah. 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 Absolutely, absolutely. And it, first of all, it's important to say that even though the presentation was focusing on the classroom space within a school context, we are constructed around framings of whiteness in every space that we're in, because that is one of the ways in which we understand racism as being endemic and embedded in, in, into our social fabric. And so, especially for, for within, when we look at this within the context of education, right from early years, children are marked as being invisible and visible in the spaces that they're in. They're marked in a particular way. And so what you've highlighted um, really beautifully, Aisha, is that experience of, of knowing that you are the other in the room and being reminded that you are the other in the room, but not seeing any way of challenging and identifying that as a problem. And, and that is what we're talking about in terms of the, the impossibility of, of blackness in spaces. You, you know that you're marked in the space, but because everything that is normalized within that space is constructed around whiteness, you can't challenge the normal. Because the moment you challenge the normal, you are further pathologized as being the other. And so you always are in that position of choosing to either perform whiteness to assimilate as much as you can so that you can be unmarked, even though that's an impossibility, or you recognize that you are being marked in the space and you deal with those interactions. And those interactions are often microaggressions. The things that happen on an everyday basis that are those subtle, demeaning, insensitive reminders that tell you that you're the other in the space. And those are ongoing. They're sometimes conscious, they're sometimes unconscious, but the impact remains the same. Um, Grid, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I, this is very exciting. Uh, Muna, I've been following your, your tweets on, uh, on Twitter for a while and I was like, yay, finally, I, I get to meet you at least digitally. Um, what, what, what was going through my mind was that, like for me, it's not only the impossibility, impossibility of blackness as such in classrooms, but 
here, like I, I'm in Innsbruck, Austria, and I teach at the, um, uh, I'm in a teacher education institute. And um, my, my field is English language teacher education. Mm -hmm. And I do lots of textbook analysis mm -hmm. from a diversity perspective. So I look at textbooks and see how diverse are they? Who is represented? Who is not represented? Who is represented in which kind of context? And it's terrible. It's really, really awful. And it's, but this is one part. The other part is that when I talk to students about this, they are like, they have like eye-opening um, moments because then, you know, they, they, they are, they reflect that they have not been aware of the many stereotypes that are surrounding them. And the other day a student was saying that he cannot even watch Big Bang Theory without gender glasses anymore. And I find this mm -hmm. fantastic. But then what I think is really difficult and also frustrating is that is the impossibility of the discourse with my colleagues, that when I when when I talk to them and I and I raise these kind of issues, and then I say, you know, like have a look at this textbook and look what what it does, and then the reaction is, yeah, that it 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 reflects the way it is, like it reflects society, and I'm like, no, it doesn't. It 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 constructs society, and and it kind of re-implements an, an ideology that sees white as as really far up on the on on the hierarchical ladder. Mm -hmm. So, and this is so frustrating. So what do we do in societies like Austria that has a specific history, that has, you know, a, a certain demography? What, like, how do we get this discourse going? And how do we get the, the like, like the, so to say, the adult generation to have, or to develop this critical mind that the student generation is willing to develop? But, but like, this is so frustrating how, People my age and older refuse to acknowledge that there that we have a problem there, right? Mm. So, so what do we do? Thank you. Yeah, I think the, the key things are exposure and education, and it, it ultimately comes down to that. The only way we are going to challenge whiteness is to acknowledge that those who reinforce and uphold whiteness benefit from it, and we don't always reinforce whiteness through action sometimes mm -hmm. we reinforce it through inaction as well and so you will encounter people that are willfully ignorant because it benefits them for things to remain as they are and seeing things as the norm seeing things as, as just the usual practice means that things just don't change and they are not affected by that change that doesn't happen where you see it becoming almost um unavoidable is when there is the exposure to the other and that exposure to the other comes in a number of ways it is the physical exposure to the other where you have people that are marked as different in the space and you notice that there are more and more people that don't fit into this social perception of the norm and you start to ask questions or it is the the exposure to the knowledge around what is being experienced around you alternative knowledges and so when we talk about decolonizing the curriculum, we ask that question of not just who are the authors that we are, are working with in terms of our curriculum, but what is the, the thinking behind the decisions that we are making in how we select the curriculum that we choose? How are we determining this? What is the criteria that we're using? What is framing our understanding? What is framing our judgment? And the more understanding educators can have around those those calls for judgment that they're making the more they can start to look at alternatives mm. and and get to the point where we're no longer seeing them as alternatives but we're reframing yes. our curriculum because i think there's always a danger when we talk about decolonizing the curriculum that we start to think about alternative curriculums and that reinforces the fact that there is a standard exactly and we yeah. don't want to be doing that so it's about thinking about how we reframe our understanding that we're working with. It is really difficult if you're in spaces where whiteness is held so securely, structurally, systemically, and in terms of the bodies within that space, but it, it is a possibility. It is a possibility, but it is around what you mean by exposure and what do you mean by education in the spaces that you're in. Yeah. And if, and also when this intersects with other markets of identity such as age and gender with this which is something that i experience here mm -hmm. also i'm not austrian i'm german i'm relatively young white female 
German work, working in an Austrian institution. And it's so difficult because like most of the people who, who are in power here are, eld, are older than I am and mm -hmm. they are male and they are from Austria. Yeah. So it, this also, I mean, I'm not comparing, you know, to, to blackness, of course, like I would never, but when, when, when these identity markers intersect, I think then it gets even more complicated because it, it, it is, or it, it seems, or the, the construction is that each identity marker kind of set, sets you even like lower, right? In, in a constructed manner and, and, and in the perception, so. Mm. There is always, there's a, there's a danger and there's also a power to looking at intersecting um, um, positionalities, intersecting identities. The power is knowing that there are different lenses of analysis that you can look through a particular issue with. You see the ways in which different markers of identity are marked as other in a space. And it means you have a much more nuanced understanding of those dynamics, those complex dynamics that are happening around you. Where it can potentially be dangerous is where you look at intersecting forms of oppression as a way of becoming race evasive. Yeah. Where, you, where, you, where you say, I'm looking at this through the lens of race, gender, sexuality, etc., cetera, um, and you don't acknowledge race within that conversation. And, there, and again, that serves you as somebody who is benefiting from whiteness to uphold whiteness within that space because you've chosen for that particular identity to remain invisible. Mm. And so it's about asking ourselves the question of if we are taking an approach that is looking at intersecting forms of oppression, how um, are we really looking at all of the intersecting forms of oppression that are part of those dynamics or are we choosing the ones that allow us to remain comfortable in our places of privilege? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm aware that we don't have enough time. Uh, we can just pick one question uh, very briefly, and then we can invite Kate um, to conclude the event. And this question is coming from Ruth. Uh, Ruth is saying, I think enabling teachers to understand what whiteness uh, in the classroom means is very difficult. Uh, do you have any suggestions of how to help them see this? Um, and just before giving the floor to Muna uh, to address this question, uh, I just would like to um, say to our colleagues that we will collect all the questions and then we will get back to you uh, to respond to them off event uh, because your questions are uh, valuable and your reflections are very important. Um, thank you. Yeah, Ruth, my response to that would be it's, it's to look at all of the things that we take for granted. Whiteness isn't marked. And so when we're looking at whiteness in terms of teacher education and, and, and allowing teachers to understand that within the spaces that they're in, it's about embedding it into our teacher education, looking at curriculum and asking the question of what is it in our curriculum development that we are taking for granted as knowledge making? What is it that we're taking for granted in terms of um, um, the way in which learning takes place? If we look at the classroom, making sure that every aspect of the, the, the teaching and learning space is looked at through the lens of, of whiteness. And that means asking the question of who is being prioritized and privileged in the work that we're doing and what are we disadvantaging? Who are we disadvantaging? What knowledges are not being um, enabled in that space? What experience are not being enabled, etc. And so it's giving teachers the tools to be able to become critical thinkers it really is just about critical reflection and looking at those everyday practices and starting to ask the questions of what am I taking for granted here? What am I assuming? And how do I start to challenge some of those assumptions? And it's a lifelong process. It's not something where you do this work and you suddenly become um, a teacher that knows everything about whiteness and is an anti-racist teacher. It's a process that you're working towards. And it's that process of constantly unlearning the things that you've taken for granted and we've all been socialized into racist structures so we all have elements of systemic racism and, and whiteness that we've been socialized to accept that we still need to unlearn so it's giving them that tools for reflective practice absolutely uh, I'm really sorry that we've run out of time and to be the one to bring this event uh, to a close. Um, my name's uh, Kate Wallace. I'm part of the Exeter Decolonizing Network. Um, to just uh, to 
to bring this event to a close, I firstly just wanted to say a huge thank you to, to Riyadh and to Asha, who um, have uh, who are the ones that that began this conversation with with Muna and um, have expertly curated and brought together um, this event um, and um, through a collaboration with the Exeter Decolonizing Network. And we're hugely honoured to, to also be partnering with with Roots Resistance on this. So thank you so much, Riyadh and Asha. Um, and um, I also wanted to, of course, say a huge um, thank you to Dr. Muna. Abdi for, for being here and for sharing with us your, your wealth of experience um, and provoking all of us to think um, critically about, about the space of the classroom that as educators and, and students we're encountering um, on, a, on an everyday basis um, and, and to, to, to ask us to reflect on, on, on what it means um, to, to acknowledge that space as constructed through the frame of whiteness um, and um, also to support us all in in the thinking that that we want to do about how we can collectively work towards structural change towards dismantling that that space and and, and towards social justice so a huge huge thank you for spending this time with us um so thank you very 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 much um i'm, I'm happy that some of us will have the chance to continue some of these conversations because it is clear that there is still so much to say and, and to discuss so um we're looking forward to seeing some of you with us in the workshop after this um, but but as as Riyadh and, and Asha said, if if any of you do feel that you, you you're not going to be part of the workshop, but you you want a space to to continue conversations with us, please do um, reach out to us personally. We we very much you know want want uh, to give people space um, to to continue these discussions. And and you can also email um, the Exeter Decolonizing Network at exeterdecolonizing at, at gmail .com. Um, So thank you again, Mina. My pleasure. And thank you all so much for engaging with the presentation. And Riyad and Asha, Kate, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join you all today. I'll see some of you shortly for the workshop. Everybody else, I may see you on Twitter or somewhere else. <laughs> but um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.